Welcome into Ion Northeast Kansas, the podcast, your community show where we have guests telling you what's happening all around the Topeka, Manhattan, Emporia, and greater Northeast Kansas area. I'm your host, Melissa Bruner. We come to you live from our WIBW TV studios in Topeka, Kansas at 4 o'clock Central Time, Monday through Friday. You can see the show stream live on WIBW.com. And if you're not available at that time, that's why you're here listening right now as we recap some of the top guests of the week. And it was a busy week week in our studio. Let's start out by looking to the future. We've been asking some of our area school superintendents to come on the show as we wrap up the school year around our area. One of our area school districts, USD 437, the Auburn Washburn District, that's kind of the south portion of Topeka and Shawnee County. You'd think that they would be kind of trying to wind down as the school year winds down, but they are gearing up for some big things. Voters in the school district passed a bond issue last year, and now some of those major building projects are starting. Dr. Scott McWilliams visited the studio to tell us what is in store. This Mm -hmm. is the end of the school year though. When when is last day of class? When are students out of here for the summer? A couple of things coming up. Last day for kids next week on Wednesday. Uh, It's a half day. Yeah, Mm -hmm. May 24th. But this weekend on Sunday um, early evening, five o'clock, is uh, Washburn Rural High School graduation. So a shout out to about 450 graduates and their families. A uh, job well done to each of those students. That is quite a class, 450 mm-hmm. students. If you had to pick a headline for this past school year, what would it be? Uh, been a uh, very productive, fun, outstanding school year. You have some big things happening, and it's c- coming up in the form of a series of groundbreakings. Two of the three are already in the books. One of them was just yesterday. We have some video mm-hmm. of that one. That was at Washburn Rural High School. What is going to be added at the high school, and what are the other two projects that you're yeah. just kicking off? You bet. So in our school district, last school year in April, we were fortunate enough to uh, kick off a bond campaign. It uh, was approved in our school community, about a 61% approval rating. Uh, such a gift for our school community and our kids. Um, we were at the high school yesterday, and we were going to be building an innovation center, about a 50,000 uh, square footage uh, location uh, that's going to uh, be state of the art and provide uh, hands-on learning opportunities for kids. Uh, some of those programs we currently have in the high school, we're expanding those programs, also bringing some new innovative items and uh, programs to the kids. Yeah, a full video production studio is one of the yeah, highlights, right. at least that one caught your, our attention. One of your favorites, <laughs> absolutely. Uh-huh. And then the first groundbreaking you had last week was at Pauline Central yeah, School. What's pa- happening there? Yes, yeah, so we're going to add six classrooms right on the front of Pauline Central, and that's going to turn into a early childhood center. Uh, Early childhood is so important for all kids, um, uh, but we're really looking forward to trying to uh, focus in on the southern portion of our school district. We currently serve about 200 three and four year olds in our early childhood uh, early childhood program today. Uh, Over the next few years, we're going to double that to over 400 kids, many of which will be the students in the southern portion of our community. How are you going to be able to reach families to offer that? Is this going to be something that's going to be an expense for families? Are you going to be able to offer a lot of it that simply at low cost? Yeah, it'll be low cost to families. Uh, Currently, we're serving uh, at-risk students um, that qualify uh, ages three and four at no cost. We also have some peer models that comes uh, to us with a little bit of a cost. Uh, We're getting the word out. The reality is, unfortunately, we've had to turn away some families because we just don't have capacity for them at this time. Uh, When we tell them to please be patient and eventually we're going to have more space, there's a lot of excitement about, oh my gosh, I can't wait. That's going to be a great opportunity for our family. And the big groundbreaking happens next week, is it? Next week on Thursday. Yeah, that's that'll the be yeah, new school. May 25th, uh, we're going to do the groundbreaking for our second middle school. Uh, and that building is going to open in the 25, 26 school year. Gives us an opportunity to provide some relief, not only at Washburn Rural Middle School, but each of our elementaries. Because instead of having two buildings serving grades seven and eight, we're actually going to move six graders up to the middle school. First time we've done that in our school community, but we think that's going to be a nice fit for us. How will that help for the future and prepare the students as they go from the middle school level to high school and elementary to middle? So a couple of things. At the elementary, our buildings are tight. They're at capacity. So by moving the sixth grade out, that's going to free up three or four classrooms. Uh, between 60 to 80, 85 students. Uh, So that's going to be a tremendous relief in uh, each of our elementary schools. At the middle school, those two years, seventh and eighth grade, when you're in a building with about a thousand students, um, it just goes by really quickly, just two years in a building. Uh, So by moving sixth grade up, we're going to be able to provide more opportunities for sixth, seventh and eighth grade students. It'll be a three year run of secondary curriculum. And we think that's going to be a nice springboard for them to move into the uh, Washburn Rural High School in their ninth grade year. 
Is that something then that's more consistent with what other districts do around the state? Because I, I don't think there are that many that still have sixth yeah. graders in the elementary school. The reality is we're a bit of an outlier with only having grade seventh and eighth at the middle school. The more common approach is grade six, seventh, and eighth. So we are getting an alignment with many other school districts in the state of Kansas. I thought something interesting Principal Ed Raines said at yeah. the high school groundbreaking yesterday was that you use student involvement to determine some of this too. How, how important is that, yeah. listening to the kids and what they yeah. want? Yes, student voice is so important. And as a matter of fact, with some of the um, adjustments and the advances we've had with our career and technical education program, uh, it's been based uh, solely on student voice. And hey, can we do this? I have an interest in that. What about this career field? And so we're trying to match not only job market needs, also with student interest. That's been a perfect alignment for the program at the high school. And keeping the students engaged is a big win, isn't it? <laughs> Without question. <laughs> Dr. Yes. Scott McWilliams, thank you so much for being here and bringing us up to date on your district. Thank and you for having have me. fun at graduation Absolutely. this weekend honoring Exciting. the student. Thank you. I'm super excited for that innovation center with the full video production studio. We sure didn't have that when I was in high school. So it's really exciting to see the opportunities that some of these kids have. One of the other points that the Washburn Rural High School principal Ed Rains made during that groundbreaking was that about 16% of the students at Washburn Rural aren't going to be going on to traditional post-secondary higher education. So for them, it's really important to have these programs and a space to continue developing these programs so that those kids Kids are just as prepared for their futures and entering the workforce as the kids who might go to some traditional post high school schooling. So the, that's a very important point to make. And we're excited to see what happens in 2025 when these facilities all open. Also looking ahead are the Shawnee County Commissioners. Commissioner Kevin Cook was our guest. We have a commissioner visit us once a month on the Red Couch Show. One thing that the Shawnee County Commission recently finished was the redistricting process. And he explained that to us. They're looking to the future when it comes to the county county's parks as well because they will be having some new tools at their disposal. Uh, redistricting, let's start with that. Redistricting process for commissioners. A little bit of background. Why does this happen? Okay, so by law every three years the county commission districts are reviewed so that each commissioner would have one-third of the population of the city of Topeka and one-third of the population of Shawnee County. So you don't want one commissioner having just the city and representing the city and then the other two representing the non-city interests. So each one of us has equal interest. Also, uh, one commissioner can't have all of Lake Sherwood. Half goes to one district and half goes to the other district. So there's a lot of moving pieces and you do it there every is. three years, every, not every 10 years. No, every it's three, a three years. Year thing. So and the other thing we try to do is we try to manage to make as least amount of moves as possible so that everybody's bounty districts pretty much stays within the same. Um, and so there's not a lot of wild new plans that get drawn up. We do have a graphic that shows the old districts and the new districts. And what we've highlighted are those portions there on either side that are actually moving. So, so really, what was the movement? So we have five precincts that moved. And in my commission district on 29th Street on the eastern border of Shawnee County, Pawnee District, that precinct moves up into mine from Commissioner Mays. And then over at Lake Sherwood, some of the ones on the north side of Lake Sherwood moved from Commissioner Mays to Commissioner Ripon, and the ones on the south moved from Commissioner Ripon to Commissioner Mays. And so just a little flip flop so the populations all worked out right. And only five precincts moving. Correct. So that's actually not bad at all. There were, no. like you said, no, no wild boundary lines are, yes. are being drawn here. So. Gage Park Improvement Authority. That's the next thing I want to ask you about because okay. that was a discussion that actually was taking place at the meetings this week. This was created through the sales tax that was passed last fall, correct? That's correct. So the Kansas legislature authorized a sales tax to be uh, permitted if the voters of Shawnee County authorized it and then the voters of Shawnee County approved it. And so that sales tax is starting to be collected and then we'll start to see we have an improvement authority that will be then dividing that between the Discovery Center, the zoo, and the Shawnee County Parks. And so we're gonna to start to see some improvements made, some additions made, and so some things for the uh, Gage Park. I mean, it's such a jewel for our entire county and our community, and we wanna to continue to see it grow and thrive and improve. How quickly might we start to see some of that money dished out and then spent on improvements? And what kind of oversight will the commission and the city council have in terms of how that money is spent? So by, again, by, we go back to the statute, we go back to the law anytime we have any question. So part of the money will just automatically go to the Discovery Center, to Shawnee County Parks and Recreation, and then to the zoo. But there's another portion of it that is by the advisory board, and that has representatives of both the city and the county on that, and that's for other special improvements, something that's 
maybe working in, in conjunction with. So one of the things, for example, that would come out of it is the Gage Park Master Plan. What's going to be the history or the future of the Gage Park for the next 50 or 100 years? And looking at where the zoo, what expansions might we look at for future zoo expansions or things of that nature? You had a cautionary tale, which I thought was a very important cautionary tale of the discussion. Part of the beauty of a park is green space, nature to enjoy. So what was your concern when you started hearing these talks and these ideas? You know, one of the concerns that you get is it, it's like filling your house with valuable antiques. And when do you stop? When does it go <laughs> from being really, uh, you know, being a showcase to being overcrowded and over full? And so Gage Park, part of the park is beauty is its openness and its spaciousness. And if you continue to add amenity after amenity after amenity, you lose that openness. And we don't want to see that. We want to be continue to have that breath of air in the middle of the city. So really planning and being cautious of how much you're building as you're planning. If taxpayers don't like what these boards are ultimately deciding to spend the money on, what kind of recourse might they have? Because these are their tax dollars. Buddy. These are their tax dollars. And so it does have a renewal date. And so at some future point, if they say this isn't working the way we thought it was, it's not what it's panning out to be, we don't like the way this is, or we just want to lower the tax period, there is a way to rescind it. There is a way to have it go away. But it is a way to make these improvements and hopefully not hit people as hard as if you were going from scratch and saying you're all going to pay property tax or this kind of tax or the other. Right. The overall goal is that the taxes that we have will maybe lower and so we would be able to redirect those to either other sources or property tax relief. And I think that's what a lot of us are looking at is what property tax relief can we give to the taxpayers. So as we like to say, stay tuned because those discussions are obviously going to be continuing. We are continuing to look ahead to the United Way of Caw Valley's Day of Giving. That event is coming up June 7th. The whole concept is to see how large of an impact our community can have in a single day to support United Way and its areas of focus. One of those areas of focus is meeting basic needs. Tom Fox from Catholic Charities of Kansas visited the Red Couch this this week. It is truly eye-opening to hear from an organization that assists people with things like food, with rent and utility assistance, just how dramatically they have seen the needs, the numbers of people coming to them increase within the past couple of years. So Tom talked about that and why it really just brings home the need for all of us to do what we can to support each other if we are able to, or you know, maybe we need this help ourselves, why we're going to be relying on the community to come together. United Way serves several agencies working with basic needs and you know we're really proud to be a part uh, a partner agency and have been involved in this for a long time um, but Catholic Charities has one of the if not the busiest food pantry in Topeka hmm. but we also serve Jackson and Jefferson counties with our mobile resource bus um, and it delivers food once a month to each of those communities um, and then we also this day of caring will First, for the first time, our day of giving will um, encompass Douglas County and Lawrence and our center there, which has a big food pantry. In addition to food, we work with utility assistance, rental assistance, prescription assistance, um, any way we can help people uh, make it, you know, come back from a crisis situation. Um, and that could be um, families experiencing homeless already or looking to prevent an eviction, um, anything um, that's going on. And then, of course, we also do a little more than just basic needs. We go beyond that um, afterwards to, to work with people with, uh, you know, help workforce development programs to get them into trade certificates that are in demand um, and then teach a lot of financial skills through two super successful programs. So. How much have you seen the demand for those services and that assistance increase? It's amazing that you know, food is sort of the bellwether. It tells us what's coming. Um, and between July 1st last year and Christmas, we had a 32% increase in traffic to our pantries. In Topeka specifically, it was over 40%. Oh my goodness. Um, and so the need for food is extreme um, for people just because mostly the inflation situation on groceries. I mean, everyone experienced the eggs and butter mm -hmm. situation. Um, right around Thanksgiving of all times, you know, but um, but you know, for lower income families or families that find themselves in an, in a laid off situation or something like that, um, that's particularly rough. 
for us, it's kind of a sandwich effect too, because normal, you know, everyday folks like me, I might go to the store and add an extra 10 bucks to give to the food drive at my parish or school or wherever I'm going. And every time I go or once a month, well, the 10 bucks doesn't go as far no. anymore, right? And so what used to be eight cans of food that we could give away is now just six or something. And then even I'm feeling it, so I might only do eight this month, right. uh, you know, and something like that. And so um, we had less coming in and more people needing it. Um, the trickle down and now everything yeah. interrelates. When you talk about basic needs, <coughs> and part of the answer here, I'm sure, is just in, ingrained in the definition of basic. How sure. does meeting those basic needs also flow down and up to the other things that people need to address in their lives to truly re -get, get back on their feet. <clears throat> For a long time, food especially was sort of, a, is, is more than just meeting that need and that need for nutrition. It was also an outreach mechanism. So many people didn't realize we did so much more mm -hmm. um, and that we could get them involved and get them further in, many, in so many different ways. Um, one of the programs that that leads to when we meet people for the first time with food or utility assistance is called Family Financial Transformations. And it's the most intensive kind of financial program, but it has savings matches um, and all kinds of extreme, of, of serious and intensive one-on-one -on -one coaching. Because we learned that if you just give someone a class Six months later, when you're in the financial crisis, you don't remember what happened in the class, right? right? Um, but if you have someone walking through it with you every day or every week, that makes a big difference. Um, and also, it's being studied by the Kansas University School of Communications right now. It's in a long term, or they're in their third year. And what it's showing so far, they're using validated measures of hope and self-confidence. And not only are people keeping those gains a year later in their finances, but also in their hope and their self-concept. And it all starts with meeting the basic needs, because when the basic needs right. are met, everything else can follow. You can't start on the other stuff if your kids are hungry. Exactly. It's hard to focus on anything And June else. 7th is the day of giving for United Way of Caw Valley, and you can donate to the Basic Needs Fund, other areas, Catholic Charities, just one of the organizations that you will be helping to support. June 7th is the day that is coming up. Tom. United Way puts it all together. We thank them and making this opportunity available, and they'll help a lot. UWKVdayofgiving.org is where you can go to learn additional information, and it's also where you can go on June 7th to make your donations if you are able and also unlock some matching gifts from community partners and really join together to have a great impact on our community. May 17th marked a very important anniversary, really nationally. It was May 17th, 69 years ago, when the U.S. Supreme Court handed down its decision in the Brown versus Board of Education case, leading the way in desegregating our nation's schools, ruling that separate but equal is inherently unequal. The city of Topeka, the Topeka School District, played a key role in that decision. Oliver Brown, the namesake of the case, one of several plaintiffs in that case. And so the day itself is very important for Topekans. We had several events around the area. One of those was organized by Michael Bell, a resident here, president of the Tennessee Town Neighborhood NIA. And Michael had a discussion with us ahead of the event that he planned on just what this anniversary means. In my estimation, and I think in the estimation of a lot of other people, the Brown versus Topeka Board of Education uh, Supreme Court decision was the most significant Supreme Court decision of the 20th century. And it was because not only of what it did directly, uh, say that the um, um, policy established in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, separate but equal, uh, was wrong, but it also set the stage for all of the things that happened after uh, the 1954 Brown decisions, uh, decision rather, the um, civil rights movement, uh, the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, the 68 Fair Housing Act. All of those things happen uh, because of Brown v. Board. Yes. Every time I think about the history of this case, Michael, I'll tell you one thing that strikes me is, you know, today we think about lawsuits and we think about, oh, somebody's going to make a big payday in this. This really was about real everyday people simply wanting to do the right thing, wasn't it? It was, and that's a really great way to put it. Um, yeah, we live in a day and age now where 
everybody seems to have an ulterior motive for doing things. There were no ulterior motives. Uh, there were just people who wanted to do the right thing, people who believed in justice, people who believed in fairness, um, and and they um, worked really hard. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we'll discuss, I think, on Saturday, um, that doesn't get discussed a lot, is the Kansas portion of Brown v. Board and what was going on here in Topeka and what happened at the Kansas level. Um, so we'll be looking at, at all of that. But yes, I, I agree with that assessment. Uh, it was uh, completely uh, motivated by um, good things. As a Topekan, how proud are you of Topeka's role in this landmark case? Uh, it's one of the things I think I'm most proud of uh, because we had people, it's an interesting thing, uh, uh, the case itself, Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, when you look at it that way, the Board of Education was on the wrong side of history. But uh, there were people here in Topeka uh, on the Brown side who uh, uh, worked really hard to make sure that uh, equality uh, was uh, achieved. And so, um, yes, th there, there's a huge uh, significance there. What lessons do you think we take from it that we need to continue working on today? The big lesson, I think, given our day and age now, is that uh, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Um, as great of a decision as that was, we must always be aware that we have to defend the ground that has been gained because there will be people out there who will want to um, take us back. Um, so uh, that I think is the most important lesson probably uh, that we can learn. By the way, some local folks say they are already planning a huge celebration leading up to the 70th anniversary of Brown v. Board coming up next year. We had some very special guests this week in the studio, Dylan and his mom, Sarah. It's a topic that's really personal to me as well. May is NF Awareness Month. NF stands for neurofibromatosis. It is a group of genetic conditions that cause tumors to grow on your nerves and you have nerves throughout your body. So NF can affect people in many different ways. No two people are alike. During the month of May, those who advocate for NF awareness, including the Children's Tumor Foundation, do a lot of activities in order to let more people know what NF is. In fact, one of their slogans is make NF visible. So that is why Sarah and Dylan decided to come into the studio and share a little bit about what he goes through in hopes of increasing understanding. Welcome to both Hello. of you. Yeah, Dylan's <laughs> giving a wave. I'm glad that we can have this conversation because as a lot of people know out there, my nephew Owen, who's now 21 years old, also has NF. He has NF1, Dylan. So that is where this conversation comes from because I know what neurofibromatosis is, but a lot of people out there don't. So first of all, Dylan, tell us about yourself. How old are you? Where do you go to school? Um, I am 12 years old and I go to Northern Hills Elementary School. And what sorts of things do you like to do with your time? Um, usually when I go to the school, I usually get some math and stuff like that in ELA and science. But I'm kind of doing good in the school years until, until our promotion. <laughs> what about summer vacation? What do you have planned for that? Ooh, um, I'm, someday we might go on a trip. <laughs> She's looking at mom with that. <laughs> My mom knows what it is because we might go there sometime. All right. Well, we hope you get to go on that trip. Yeah. And it's fun, Sarah, to hear Dylan talk because it's just he's a normal kid. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, that mm -hmm. NF and the Children's Tumor mm -hmm. Foundation, one of the organizations that works to research NF and support families like yours, like my sister's, uh, is to, to really make NF visible. That's the hashtag. So if you had to explain to people how NF affects Dylan, what are the sorts of things that maybe people can't see? Um, with him, I would say the most, um, the things that you can't see are the, you can't see the, 
Now I'm getting nervous. It's okay. But just, <laughs> does he, so first of all, we talk about tumors on nerves. Where does Dylan have tumors? So he has some that have um, come up on his back and on his belly. Uh, he had one on his knee that he actually ended up picking off um, last summer. It's just a tiny little thing. Yeah, some, so cause, and you're right, because some of the bump. tumors are tiny little bumps, tiny mm -hmm. little growths. My nephew has what they call cafe au lait spots, yep, little brown patches. So. You have one on your arm. I can see it, yep, actually. Right here. Just right there. He's got some on his knees. Most of them are on his belly, groin area, under his arms. And in other people, it's more obvious. Other people have tumors that can be very disfiguring. Mm -hmm. Some people have it become so involved, it leads to perhaps limited use of limbs, or they may lose their limbs. It can be difficult sometimes with Dylan because people don't necessarily see that he no, has something that affects him. They don't. And the other things that they don't see are um, he has what they call UBOs on his MRI scans, and they're just called unidentified bright objects. It's white, um, hyper eliminated white brain matter. And those come and go, they generally shrink over time, um, but they do cause cognitive delays, um, learning delays, things like that. That's where they don't see what's going on as far as the physical aspect of it goes. What do you explain to people NF is, Dylan? Um, I usually tell them, people, they, like, people don't, like when I tell them I have NF, they really don't care about it and they just like to constantly, people like to hurt my feelings in the school year sometimes because they don't know what I have when I have NF. That it affects you and it can make some things more tough. Yes. And that's why we're working to make NF visible so people understand that there's something that you're, you're fighting and living with and trying to overcome every single yep. day and we're very proud of you for that. How much does that, I mean that's really hard to hear. It is. I know for my nephew too, he's 21, enough for him causes issues with seizures he can't drive. You know, you want to be a normal kid. You mm -hmm. want to be a normal young man. Yeah. So what do you hope people see when they see Dylan? Um, I just want them to see a strong-willed, kind-hearted boy, just your typical 12-year-old. Um, he does have difficulty making, making friends um, because of the cognitive and social-emotional delays. Um, but I just want people to see him for him. How much does he get monitored because of his NF? I think that's important for people to know, too. Quite a bit. Um, he, we maintain an IEP at school, um, which he gets um, pull-out time with a special ed teacher, um, generally about 45 minutes a day, give or take. Um, depending on how his day is going um, with peers, uh, social interactions and such will also depend on whether or not he gets um, pulled on an individual level from from class, but um, yeah. I would say big thing is just ask, right? Yeah. Big thanks to Dylan and Sarah for their willingness and efforts to make NF visible. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to the Children's Tumor Foundation website, ctf.org. We end with something pretty fun. Shawnee County Parks and Recreation, you might not know, has more than 60 miles of trails around Shawnee County that they have. A lot of them are nature trails. Devin Cooper, who works with Shawnee County Parks and Rec, has developed this series of programs that will be unfolding throughout the summer. And we want you to know about them. I appreciate mm -hmm. you being here. Thank you for having me. What you have are a series of what, about a dozen nature hikes? What is all involved in these? Yeah, so it's about a dozen hikes. Um, it sounds like a lot. It's going to be quite crazy this summer for me, but a lot of them are just taking, going onto some of the paved trails, some of the natural trails, and kind of talking about what we see. Um, so the first two are going to be coming up, uh, first one's this Friday, and then next Monday we're going to have one, um, and we're going to look for animal signs. So, you know, looking at the trees, looking at the ground, and then talking about what we see. Um, and there's also going to be history mixed in, so Dornwood Park is going to be the first, or second hike now, um, on Monday, and we're going to talk about the old dairy ruins that are there in the ruins of an old dairy farm. I didn't even know those were there. I saw somebody mm -hmm. post a picture once and we're like, where is that? And they told mm -hmm. us, what other activities do you have planned along with simply just walking the trails? So we have, in, or I have in July, planned a Ted Inslee, walk through Ted Inslee Gardens and we're gonna look for bugs and butterflies and talk about what we see. Um, there's also a Ward Mead hike planned. Um, so walking around botanical gardens just to take pictures for social media. And something so, special for June 8th also. 
Yes, I'm pretty excited for that one. Um, I am uh, going to have a program about the 66 tornado. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one of the, well, the first F5 tornado recorded um, at all, because the system had just been created, and the biggest tornado to hit Topeka. Um, there's a lot of stories about that tornado, um, and I even have some family history associated with that tornado, so I'm pretty excited to tell those stories. We do have the, the schedule, and let's put mm -hmm. that up if we could please real quick, because this it really does encompass. You have several different programs planned mm -hmm. at Shawnee North, including the first one is this Friday, so May 19th, June 16th, July 4th, and 21st, August 18th. Those are the Shawnee North. May 22nd is the Dornwood Park visit you mentioned. Mm -hmm. National Hiking Day is June 3rd, so you have a couple different activities at Skyline Park. That's at 8:30 and 11:30 and, uh, in the morning, because we should mention most of these are taking place at 6:30 at night. Yes. Tornado talk. June 8th, like you mentioned, and then that continues even after that. We have another mm -hmm. list here to continue the <laughs> schedule. June 12th at Gage Park, June 7th, July 17th at Ted Inslee Gardens, July 20th, Ward Mead, August 14th at Garfield Park. Yeah, that is quite the schedule. Mm -hmm. If you didn't catch it all here, I'll put it online later, but how do people maybe find this schedule, the particulars of each event, and then register? Because you are asking mm -hmm. for registration. So it could be found through our social media, through Facebook and Instagram. We have been posting um, the um, naturalist program there. It can also be found online through the online catalog um, and you can register online as and well. It's just a three dollar fee for each walk or mm -hmm. in, in hike and program to kind of offset mm -hmm. some of the costs. How far in advance do you want people to register? Um, as, I guess as far as able, um, we do ask at least it'd be nice to know at least two days in advance. So look at the coming. schedule, mm -hmm. get signed up. It'd be a fun activity to do. Like mm -hmm. Every single one sounds fascinating. Yes. So Devin, so glad you developed Thank this. You. So much to explore right in our own backyards. I tell you what, those sound super fun. I love the trails that we have around our area. We are so blessed. The paved trail that's around Lake Shawnee. If you go up to Shawnee North, they have the about an eight-tenths of a mile paved loop, and then they also have another loop that goes back through the woods. So, so many places that you can go and get outside and explore. And don't forget Skyline Park, where you can go to the top of Burnett's Mound and have that fantastic view looking out over the capital city. See, we've got a lot to do and see around Shawnee County and the Topeka area. Come check us out. That'll do it for our Eye on Northeast Kansas podcast. Remember, you can see the videos from these segments and all of our guests throughout the week. If you head to WIBW.com, you can also find them on my Facebook page, which is WIBW Melissa Bruner. And you can watch them all stream live Monday through Friday, four o'clock central time. If you log on to WIBW.com as well. They also post on our WIBW 13 News Facebook or rather YouTube page as well. So you can find us on YouTube. All those social media channels are out there. Have a great week. We'll see you on the red couch.